tie it into Christmas too, so that'll be good. But uh, just looking up righteousness in the New King James was 315 references. Just righteousness. Uh, that's not righteous uh, as well. But that's just righteousness. So on your outlines there, I uh, defined some more right wiseness for you in uh, point one there. You got Old Testament, New Testament. So there's a bunch of uh, some more, I should say, a bunch of them. But there's some. There's out of 315, I only gave you a few that you can uh, spend some time looking at. I'll mention a few this morning uh, to get the gist of what's going on here. So uh, let's just start out by, by first, let's read uh, 2 Timothy. Again, 316 to remind us. Again, this is all coming out of God unveiling himself, uh, this righteous God coming, and uh, in showing this righteousness in the flesh through His Son, Jesus Christ. Of course, our, what we're celebrating these weeks coming here, especially for this day of that, uh, this month of Advent. Uh, again, John, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. Again, remember this living Word. You can't, you can't forget that. You know what I'm saying? You can't Put it aside. This is a, a daily breathing. You, as you breathe today, breathe Scripture. Allow the living Word in and to come in and flow through you. Uh, breathe that to others around you. Breathe on them this breath of life. Because you know what you've said to people before. You know what, what has come out of your mouth before. James reminds us that out of that mouth should not come cursings and blessings. Amen? But this righteousness, this right wiseness uh, must come from these lips. Amen? So this scripture that is God breathed is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work, that this man or woman of God may be righteous. Uh, so that's our proposition uh, this morning. It's also in the title. Uh, hopefully get some emails back on this, some complaints. Uh, if you complain about today's sermon, I'll really feel like John Wesley, because they are always complaining about his sermons. Uh, and one of the reasons why they were complaining about his sermon is, is because this word that we started talking about on Wednesday night a little bit, it's kind of funneled over now on Sunday morning, but this idea of perfection, Whoa. right wiseness, righteousness is perfection. And the proposition this morning states this, that you must be perfect, you must be perfect in heart to enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that's probably why we began in the church years ago that said that, that one of the statements was to ask Jesus into your heart. The seat of your heart. I mean, the seat of your life kind of thing. The, the very foundation of, of life itself. That, that, that we knew that your heart had to be transformed. Wes has said, my heart has become strangely warmed. Something happened in his heart. And when he became transformed that way, it transformed his very life. It transformed his preaching. Uh, what he said, how he taught. Uh, his whole idea of what church was to be like. So he began talking about this perfection. And what really made people upset was that he put the word Christian before the word perfection. He talked about Christian perfection. And we're not going to go into great detail some of the things that he said, but, but let's look and see what, what we can summarize out of, out of some of the scriptures this morning. Uh, so you must be perfect in heart to enter the, the kingdom of heaven. This idea of perfection, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not an acting type of perfection. It's not a, uh, a, a human perfection. You know, it's not a perfect ten. Kind of idea, you know, you got uh, 
you know, a, a physical perfection. It's not a, a, a duty perfection. It's, it's not... Um, it's, it's perfection of the heart. It's the, it's the attitude, the thoughts and intents of the heart. Because if we say things like, if your heart's not right, Wednesday night we were saying, it all goes back to the, the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, if your heart's not right, it doesn't matter what you do. So your good deeds aren't good if your heart's not right. They may look good from an external standpoint, but you can help the old lady cross the street, you know, and you think you're doing a good deed, but if you're mumbling under your breath why you have to help her across the street, you've just canceled out your good deed. Oh. You know, you can give all the money you want, and believe me, we need you to give all the money you have. But you see, if you're mumbling about it or you're complaining that so-and-so's not giving like you're giving, then your giving has become null and void because your heart's not right. Uh, you can come and, and not miss... I'm going to give you a gold star. You haven't missed a Sunday for 365 years. You've not missed a Sunday. And if you walk in on the 365th day of the 365th year and say, I've never missed a day at church my whole life, but so-and-so is such a... You've just negated your good deed. Because you're what? Your heart's not right. And we know that. And we know that. So our hearts have got to be transformed. Our hearts have got to be right. So we have to have right hearts. And this idea of righteousness. And this idea of right wiseness. And this idea of perfect heart and perfect love. And Christian perfection is all founded and grounded in, in the way our hearts are transformed. So let's look at some more definition. Definition continue there, point one, of uh, righteousness or, or right wiseness. Let's see if we can glean something this morning from this here. Genesis 15, the first place uh, in the New King James translation that we see the word righteousness. Going back to uh, Abram, before Abram became Abraham. Genesis 15, I'll just pick a few out this morning. Uh, you can look at some of those this week in your studies. But look what happens here. Uh, Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And the word of the Lord that came to Abram said to him what? Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Abraham, or Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Elizer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look, toward, look now toward heaven and count the stars. And if you are unable to number them, and he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed in the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to Abram for righteousness. Hmm. This idea of belief and faith. Here's Abram. He's quite older now. He's in his... Uh, some say 80s, I guess 90s maybe. Is that him or is that he's old? I can't remember now. Or I'm thinking of uh, another old man, um, John the Baptist. Uh, Dad, remember remember the age of this one of these? Uh, they're older and they have no offspring. And so he takes this idea of nothingness 
And he has Abram look to the stars. And, of course, when you look into the stars on a starry night, there's literally how many stars? You know, it's just so many. So, with God, again, all things are what? Possible. So this idea of righteousness begins with God. He calls you. He's calling you to righteousness. You were created for this. This is your purpose. Your way of life. To be righteous. When you move into uh, Genesis 18... And the same idea of this promise is coming. Now, let's see, Genesis 18. Oh, I think I lost my verse. 18. Oh, that's not it. Skip that one. I don't see 18.6. Do you see 18.6? Yeah. That Let's try Leviticus. Let's do one more. Leviticus 19. Uh, we, we mentioned this a little bit before. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about this idea of judging. And uh, we, we cried out, uh, sent out texts and said, Judge me. I, I beg you to judge me. Hold me accountable. Keep me in right relationship. That kind of idea. Uh, this idea of transformational accountability. Uh, in, Gen in Leviticus 19, of course, uh, God speaks uh, here to Moses. In verse 19, one, he says, uh, And the Lord God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This call, this cry, this command... To holiness. A Christian perfection. Holiness of heart and life. A righteousness. I'll move across the page to verse 15. You shall, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. Sounds so uh, Jamesy there, doesn't it? In righteousness, with the right heart. So we judge one another, we hold each other accountable because we love each other. Not because we want to one better the other, but because we love each other, we care for each other. We desire to be in right relationship with God and with others. Uh, let's go down to Job now. We'll skip, skip over Deuteronomy and go to Job. Here's this one who, for all intents and purposes, his, his family, his wife, his friends, all saw Job in his physical uh, trials and tribulations, and they looked at Job and said, certainly he must be unrighteous. Look at him. But Job came against them. And in uh, Job 27, uh, Job is having this uh, discourse of, co of course, and uh, 
his uh, friends have been have come to him. In this case, uh, Bill Dad, one of his buddies, had come to him, and uh, surely they're they're sure that something's wrong with Job. I mean, you just don't go through all this these trials and tribulations and have all this calamity fall upon you, and and certainly there's got to be some kind of sin in your life. But uh, verse chapter 27, Job continues. He says, "Moreover, as God lives." who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of my of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right, talking to Bildad, till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, and will not let it go. It's a big deal, isn't it? He's holding fast to this right wiseness. Remember, he asked the question, from where does wisdom come? Back in the turn of chapter 8, you'll see that. But from where does wisdom come? This wisdom, this right wiseness, where does it come from? Move into chapter 29. He continues with his discourse. Oh, let's look down to... Um, There's just so much for you this morning. Still start in verse 12, 29, 12. Because I delivered the poor who cried out the fatherless and, fatherless and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Put on righteousness. See that the intimacy, the putting on righteousness. You're going to see how that is stated in the New Testament when we talk about put putting on Christ. The righteousness. To put on righteousness. Let's move into Psalms for a minute. Psalm chapter four. Oh, let's just go to one one nineteen for the time's sake. Psalm one nineteen. Look at Psalm 119, uh, starting in verse 137. Psalm 137, that uh, Hebrew letter, 137 to 144. Let's read that. Psalm 119, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delight. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. So this idea of righteousness is what? It's not just a one-time thing. His righteousness is what? Everlasting. Everlasting. Forever and ever and ever. This righteousness. Let's go to Proverbs now. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8. Start in verse 1. Yeah. Proverbs 8. Does 
not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the high hill, beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. For my mouth will speak truth, wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. Righteousness. Oh, there's so many more. Again, uh, let's go to 21, Proverbs 21. Just picking out a few for you. Proverbs 21, verse uh, 21. Let's go up to 20. That will remind us of, of, Christian, of uh, Christmas maybe when we uh, get some treasures. There is, there is desirable treasure, Proverbs 21, 20, and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. He who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. I'll keep on going. Isaiah 61. <coughs> now 61, 1 through 3. Pretty familiar verse for, for many of you. Isaiah 61. Again, this is a, a uh, messianic uh, prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the per prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called, what? Trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Trees of righteousness. A forest of righteousness. Whoa. Let's do Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. The weeping wise prophet, we'll call him. How's that? Wow. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. You getting this? This is you. You back at John 15 yet? All right, the in the branch. This connection. Jeremiah says of the Lord that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. 
the Lord of Righteousness. That's one of the names, Joy, we were looking at this week. The name of the Lord. Which one is it? Uh, Yahweh Sitkinu. Is that right? Is that how you said it? The Lord of our Righteousness. Uh, let's jump to the New Testament now. Matthew 5. Some of these we've looked at, so I'm trying to mark which ones we looked at. But Matthew 5. We'll start there because we've, uh, we've mentioned it. Matthew 5, 6. In the being attitudes. 5, 6. Blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. The special of the day. Righteousness. Righteousness. You remember last week we looked at 520? And Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 633. Seek first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So again, you see the different aspects of righteousness. Uh, here is this idea of seeking, of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Uh, go to Luke now. Luke was a real interesting one. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 67. This is a prayer of prophecy from a father to his son. So when we have dedicated children in the past and we've lifted them to the Lord and asked for His, uh, his blessing upon them, have we been able to pray this kind of blessing and prophecy upon our children? Look what Zacharias says about his newborn babe. That's going to come. It has come. And, of course, what's happened to Zacharias during this time where he has been muted for these nine months or so. And then his name, John, is given. And they all marvel and he becomes... His tongue is now loosed. And then there is a question that going around the, the family now, going around the, the city in verse 66, and they all wonder, what kind of child will this be? You know, these blessings and these curses that we put upon children today. We look at a kid, we look at his background, we look at his parents, and we say, oh, What's, what, what kind of, what's, it, what's it going to amount to? And society is labeled. We put labels on our children and for different reasons and different things. And we as Christians need to speak this righteousness, amen, into these children. What kind of child will this be? And Zechariah, after being muted for nine months, the first thing that comes out of his lips is this blessing. This thing, if we duct taped you for nine months, what's the first thing that would come out of your mouth after we pulled that tape away? Yeah. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> for He has visited and redeemed His people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David. And He has spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets we have been since, who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before all the days of our life. And you, child, he goes on, will be called the prophet of the highest. You will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, 
to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit, and was, des and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. What kind of child will this be? Hmm. Uh, go to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, 17. For if by the man's, Adam's, offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, Judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Uh, Galatians, we looked at and read that one already. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Starting out chapter 4, Paul says that he's a prisoner of the Lord and he's uh, calling those that are listening, those that, his hearers, those that, in the church of Ephesus, to walk worthy of the calling which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then as you move into that letter, he mentions about the, uh, the trickery uh, that has come, um, about being, uh, that we should no longer be children, being like tossed to and fro, about every care and wind of doctrine. So he's again warning of the deception that's uh, coming to the church. And then by the time you get to verse 20, he says, but you have not so learned. He's drawing that contrast of the, those who are living in deception, now those who are going to live in the truth. He says, you haven't learned this. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you what put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust." and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Putting on this righteousness. Just like we saw before. Uh, i got Philippians chapter 1. Uh, righteousness is also this. How does it come? Where does it go? Where is it going? This idea. Paul prays for this righteousness. Uh, for his folks in the, in the church. And he says this, uh, Philippians 1.9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. So righteousness produces fruit. Fruits of righteousness, which are by who? Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Sounds real John 15, doesn't it again? The vine, the branch, and the fruit. 
or Second Timothy, you know. Uh, and and for for John, we'll go to First Peter, so that he doesn't yell at me later, wondering why we didn't go to First Peter. Should have been there already. <laughs> First Peter two. First Peter two. Uh, Of course, what's chapter 2 all about? He's, uh, he's drawing this uh, connection for you that you have been grafted in, that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, uh, that uh, you also, as living stones, you've been grafted in uh, to those uh, of the chosen generation. You are now also a chosen generation, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. That's good stuff, isn't it? Yes. And then as you move in, uh, go down to verse 21 now. It says, For this, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth. His steps committed no sin, no deceit came out of his mouth. That's his steps. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. For some reason, we've got this theology in the church that says after we've been uh, justified by our sins, We've begun this life. We've received righteousness. You've been imputed and imparted righteousness. Amen. Now we somehow go back to living this old way. We like sheep have gone astray was before your heart was strangely warm. You were going astray before Christ came into your life. Not after. We don't continue to walk in the same way. We walk in a new way. Yes. Righteousness. Uh, Second Peter, chapter two. Uh, the whole whole chapter two you can read, uh, but I'm just going to start in verse um, nineteen. Read down to the end there. Uh, when while they promise them liberty, again he's talking about what false teachers. Don't you find it interesting that this idea of righteousness is coming on the heels of what they're teaching? This false teaching, whether it was somebody in the days of the Old Testament prophets who were saying things and the old prophets were raised up and they spoke against that. Or whether it was in the, the, new, the uh, early church days where again there were those who, who, were, who came up to, to refute what the truth of the gospel was and then those of Peter and Paul and others rose up to speak against it. Or whether it was in the days of those like Luther or Wesley and the teachings were going on and then they were ro- uh, raised up to speak against this this truth, or to speak this truth against this deception. And here's verse 19. This is 2 Peter 2, 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome and, and latter and the latter end is worse from them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having not known it, they turn to the holy commandment, than to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. 
But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. That picture of, hey, wait a minute, you know the truth, yet you want to go back to the old way of life? You know, it's the whole millstone around the neck thing, it's the whole thing. Uh, the other part of Proverbs where it says, uh, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Yeah. It's just plain stupid. It's absolutely ridiculous. But the deception calls us to that. But the cheap grace calls us to that stupidity. Oh, and then lastly, of course, First uh, John chapter three. First John three seven to ten. Again, this in the in the age of deception. John says this, little children. 3 7. 1 John 3 7. Little children, let no one what? Deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Wow. Whoa. Righteousness. Now, if you, if you could look at all these I just gave you this morning and really go through the 325 of them, I think you can come to a, an overwhelmingly uh, underlying truth of it all, that this idea of righteousness is not a righteousness that we can produce in and of ourselves. I mean, you can just go right back to what Jesus said and in, in uh, Matthew when he said that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of of the scribes and Pharisees. All of this righteousness, Old Testament or New Testament, was, was to bring us, was to ground us in the whole heart of the matter. That if your heart wasn't right, you could not be righteous in His sight. You could try to perform good duties, but if your heart wasn't right, it wasn't really righteous. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, Last point. We'll go to Matthew 19. Because this picture of this rich young ruler gives us a great picture of this very statement that Jesus says in Matthew or in the yeah, in Matthew uh, 5 about your righteousness having to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And in Matthew 19, this is the whole crux of the matter here. You've got this rich young ruler Who comes to Jesus? Matthew 19, 16 to 22. And there's some points there for your, on your outline. Now behold, one came and said to Jesus, Good teacher, what, what good thing shall I do, underline that, that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. And he said, that, and, G, and uh, the young man said to Jesus, well, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Young man said to Jesus, All these things I have kept, underline that, from my youth. What do I still lack? Underline that. 
A lot of eyes in there, don't you think? Jesus said to him, Well, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, sell what you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had a bunch of stuff. He had great possessions. Pretty appropriate for this time of the year too, don't you think? As we're going out and buying stuff and selling stuff and getting stuff and accumulating more stuff, uh, this rich young ruler, this rich young guy, who had kept these commandments, it says, from his youth. This, there's a debt to right wiseness. There's a debt to it. And the debt screams in these few verses here. And the first part is 16 and 17. When he says, What shall I do that I may have eternal life? Nothing. There's nothing you can do. Amen? There's nothing you can do to retain or, retain or have eternal life. You can't do it. Eternal life is a gift. Eternal life was given to us thanks to Jesus on the cross. What good thing shall I do? And then he goes into the whole source of this goodness. So he says, why do you call me good? Even Jesus himself says that God is good. The Father. That everything comes from the Father. That Jesus is proclaiming and living this righteousness because of His relationship with the Father. The source of why Jesus does what He does is intimately connected to the love of the Father. The source of this goodness. And if that our source, and if we're not sourced by this goodness, nothing we do is even can possibly be good. It's like the story we use about the, the couple who are very happily married, yet they're really not Christians. And we say, well, hey, God's grace is living and moving in their lives. His love is being outpoured in their lives. They might not recognize it yet. But the reason that he treats her so well and that she treats him so well is that they have this... They have, the love of God is working in their lives. And the, and the crime or the cry of that is that well then those of us in the church who are married well then we should be able to proclaim that as well. I mean if people outside the church are showing God's love then you'd think that people in the church should be Showing God's love. It's a source. It goes back to the source. And he says the source of this goodness, the source of this love, is from God. And that you do not in in inherit eternal life. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of eternal life. He is the source of it. The second part is the source of the law. Now remember we looked last week about what was the purpose of the law. In verse 18 and 19, the rich young man says, Well, I've kept... Uh, which one should I keep? And Jesus said, Well, here, try these on. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear a false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Every one of those has to do with how he, what? Treats others. Yes. How he treats others. Love God. Love your neighbor. Isn't that interesting? How he treats others. The source of the law. The source of the law is how we treat others. And what is the source of the law? Well, remember back in Galatians, we said the whole purpose of the law was what? Go 
Galatians 3.19. What purpose then does the law serve? The law was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Why was the law given? Well, before faith we were kept under guard by the law. Verse 23. Kept for faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Yes. The source of the law. And then as he goes on and he mentions these, he's kept these laws, and then the rich young man says to him, all these things I have kept. Well, right there he's already null and voided himself. And the reason why he does that is because of the extra part that's put in at the end of verse 20. And where he has this, what, what, have I, what do I still lack? See, if the source of his law was Jesus, then he would not lack. But since the source of his law was self, then he still lacked. That's right. That make sense? Yes. This was his doing. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? What I have kept? What I still lack? Then you got to finish up with the source of the surrender. Because once you realize that you're lacking, it's not that you go out and get more. It's that you give it all up. That's kingdom mentality stuff. Oh, what am I like? Oh, i got this void in my heart. You know how this works. You tried it. You found out at some point in your life, don't know how old you were. Uh, could have been your 10s, your 20s, your 30s, who knows. But you found out that you were missing something in your heart. You were lacking something. So you went and you sought the world for something that would fill the void in your heart. And it was health, and it was wealth, and it was fame, it was fortune, it was relationships, it was money, it was this, it was that. You tried to fill that God-shaped void with something that was not God-shaped. And you still found out that you still lacked. But then you came to this point of surrender. Because you found out that you couldn't do it any longer. You couldn't accomplish it. You couldn't fill the void. You couldn't have the works enough to inherit eternal life. So you had to come to this point of surrender. So Jesus goes on and says, well, if you want to be perfect, now remember the original question was, what, what must I do to inherit, to have eternal life? So Jesus is making this relationship between eternal life and this Perfection. If you want to be perfect, i.e., have eternal life, then what do you have to do? Well, you go and sell what you have. Well, wait a minute, how do I get more if I sell what I have? Worldly wise, it doesn't make sense. Because the world. I'm supposed to accumulate. You know, stockpile. Come on. I was at your house, Y2K. You stockpiled. I saw you. You still eating cans from 13 years ago. You stockpile. If you want to have this eternal life, if you want to have this righteousness, if you want this perfection... Christian perfection, perfection of the heart, perfection of the heart and your life, then go and sell what you have, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. The source of surrender. 
We found in the church that uh, you can surrender for the wrong reasons. Oh yeah. Well, I want to go to the altar today because uh, you know if I figure the quicker I get to the altar, the quicker the preacher will quit preaching. If I get there quick enough, he'll quit preaching. I can get to lunch. Whoa. Yeah. Oh no, I, I know. I'll go to the altar because I can see heaven, hell, heaven, hell. Just makes so much more sense to go to heaven than to hell. So I'll just go and surrender and say this prayer and do this stuff, and then I'll, and then I'll, and then I'll. So he takes him from this again, this external doing, and brings him into this part of being. I forgot to write it down, but even when, if you looked up the word, was it holiness? Just in Webster, and it said something like the the art of being holy, holiness, as if it, we thought it was a way we dressed. Or how much scripture we know. Or our attendance. Or our numbers. Or our finances. As real indicators of what a healthy, holy church looks like. Go and sell what you have. So if I was to line up what Jesus says to what church growth would say, just for fun, I would say that the church that doesn't have anything would be more perfect, would be perfect, and the church who looks like they have everything wouldn't be so perfect. Hmm. Well, then somebody would say, well, you couldn't do that, Pastor. You couldn't judge something like that. I'm like, okay, well, then everybody just put your heart on the table, then we'll really judge you. Just, just tear us right open and see where our hearts are. Yes. See, why do we do what we do? See, why, do, why does our church really exist? Does it really exist because Jesus is Lord and we want people to be healthy? Yeah. yeah. Is that why we exist? Yeah. Or do we exist because we're in this some kind of competition to somehow, some way, be the best church in town so that we could get the accolades and the calls and the numbers and the... But see, of course, just being small doesn't make you perfect either, though. Because it goes back to source. See, I can be poor... Because I choose to be, or I'm poor because I've surrendered to be. Does that make sense? And I can be poor because I don't go out and work, because I don't take care of my finances, because I do all these things, and that what's and that's the fruit of my labor or lack of labor, which makes me poor. Or I can have this vow, this surrender of poverty or whatever you want to call it the surrender of stuff and look like I'm poor but I'm really rich it goes back to this source it goes back to the thoughts and intents of your heart and of all the times of the year that we should be really concerned about our hearts you think around this time of the year it really does matter Why we do what we do. And the very Christmas story that you're all going to probably watch about Mr. Scrooge and the miracle on 34th Street, what happens to the guy? His heart. His heart. Hmm. Whoa. So Jesus... Your call throughout the scripture is for us to be holy, for us to be righteous, 
for us to be perfect. Heart perfection. Heart perfection. We know our, our workings can't be perfect because we're not talking about those. We have faults. We understand that. We make mistakes. We understand that. But this idea of having a holy heart, that is what you came for, Jesus, to create in us clean hearts and renew steadfast spirits within us. So may we be aware of that truth this day, and may we cling to your truth, and may we be holy. May we have this heart holiness, this Christian perfection in the very depths of our soul, so that out of us will flow rivers of living water. May be so this day. May we be able to check our attitudes and allow our attitudes and thoughts and intents of our heart to come under the authority of you and your word. And may we be open to each other that we will come under the accountability of one another so that we don't do anything or say anything that doesn't line up with you and your word. Continue to transform us at prayer. Have your way in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So let's receive together this morning and give together as we go. You're reminded of this truth. Jesus, the very perfect picture of what true love is. No greater love has one for another than he lay down his life. You just can't lay down your life because it's the right thing to do. If your heart's not in it, it's not going to happen. So come this morning. May our hearts be right this Christmas season. We get ready for 2014. I cannot believe it. <coughs> Lord Jesus.
Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a steadfast spirits within us. Do not cast us away from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. And uphold us by your generous spirit. Then we will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Continue to make us righteous in your sight, Lord Jesus. We give ourselves to you for your righteous work in us. Make this place a righteous place. For you are Lord and people are healthy. We bless your name. The righteous one. In you we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon. I think I'll be back here at uh, 5, 5 o'clock, to uh, put some decorations up. So.